much of modern bi biology relies on our understanding, our sequencing, annotation, and mapping of the genomes of organisms. And hopefully you understand a little bit about what all those words mean. We'll be using them and maybe giving you some further definitions of some of them in a bit. Of course, to be able to do this, to figure out what animals are like at the genetic level, what genes they have, how their genes are organized, how all of those genes are organized into genomes, and even the diversity within populations, we need to begin by getting samples from these organisms. And so obtaining a DNA sample is an important first step. For most studies, it does not matter what part of the animal you study as long as you get a copy of the genome of the organism. And so you can take any uh, part of an animal, any cell or group of cells that has a nucleus with a genome in it, or if we're looking at uh, prokaryotes, any group of cells that have all duplicated from the same progenitor cell, and you can figure out what the genome of that organism is. So getting DNA samples might involve going out and doing field work and taking a small tissue sample. Uh, sometimes the entire organism is collected and DNA samples are taken that way. That's particularly common for organisms with large populations uh, and organisms that are not ecologically endangered, like many insects. But others, we take samples in a way that is uh, minimally harmful. So we may tranquilize a large elephant and take a, take a sample. Now, if we're doing population samples, we may need many individuals from the same uh, population or the same species. But for much of what we're talking about, a single representative of the group that we are interested in, whether that's a species or a genus or maybe even a larger group, we get a single representative, and that can stand in as an exemplar, a representative of that entire group. But as our ability to sequence DNA gets uh, faster and faster, and it becomes less expensive, our sampling gets more and more thorough. So we might have many different uh, species in the same genus. We might have many, many different genera represented. And eventually, uh, and some levels of taxonomic sampling are already at this place, but we might have every single known species identified and then multiple representatives within each of those species. Okay, so a DNA sample, we're not going to get into the technical aspect of it, but usually there's some preservation, alcohol, or other uh, chemical methods by which the DNA can be preserved, taken back to the lab, and then eventually sequenced. Okay, and so to determine what genes an organism has, we use a number of some fairly old techniques and some very new modern techniques. So PCR is involved at one stay at step or another, often in many of these steps, and you should be familiar with PCR. Uh, PCR, of course, is short for polymerase chain reaction. It's a way to artificially copy a portion of the DNA um, and make many, many copies of it. Sometimes it's also called amplification. Once we've done that, then we can go on to the next step of, sequ of sequencing. So here I've pulled uh, a number of genes for different insect species. These are all the same orthologous gene uh, labial, which is one of the Hox genes from some Drosophila melanogaster. There are some wasps, um, uh, cockroach. Uh, anyway, these are a large number of insect samples. Now, PCR has some really nice uh, benefits. <laughs> <coughs> Excuse me. Uh, it is very, very cheap. It's very fast, but it's limited. Um, it's usually very, very targeted. All of our original understanding of genomes came by this kind of very targeted, small sequencing. Sometimes we we do different portions and then kind of puzzle them together. Uh, and so it was very easy to miss genes because you have to have primers that match the genes. So for a number of reasons, uh, PCR was more of like a hunt and find what you can find, but not find everything method. But much of what we understood about the early genomes of organisms came by this method. Today, we have much better uh, mechanisms for doing this. And this is entire genome sequencing. And I've got an animation here that I'm going to play for you. I'd like you to watch it. It just understand, it, it explains a little bit the process of genome sequencing. <laughs> 
The direct shotgun approach to genome sequencing involves breaking the target genome into small overlapping fragments of about 2 kb, cloning and sequencing each fragment, and then using computer analysis to find overlapping or contiguous sequences in each fragment. The first step is to isolate DNA from the target organism. The high molecular weight DNA is then sheared physically to the desired size. Shearing can be done either by a blender, passage through a narrow gauge syringe, or by sonication, the use of high frequency sound waves. Since shearing is a random process, the sequences of the sheared fragments from a population of identical molecules will overlap one another. The average size of the DNA fragments can be controlled by regulating the amount of shearing. The aim here is fragments of about 2 kb. The sheared DNA is loaded onto a gel. An additional lane holds molecular size markers. Once the gel has been run, the 2 kb band of the marker is identified. A plug of agarose carrying sheared DNA that is also 2 kb in size is cut out of the gel and the DNA is recovered. The next step is ligation of the 2 kb fragments into a cloning vector. The ligase reaction requires 5' phosphate and 3' hydroxyl ends, but shearing rarely produces this type of end. Therefore, the ends must be repaired before proceeding further. The enzyme S1 nuclease digests away the single-stranded tails of the sheared DNA and generates blunt-ended double strands with ends required by DNA ligase. An appropriate cloning vector is cleaved with a restriction enzyme like small 1, which produces blunt ends, and the sheared, end-repaired fragments are inserted and ligated to produce a library. The library is transformed into E. coli for amplification of the clones. Primers specific for the flanking vector sequences are annealed one at a time to each clone, and dideoxy sequencing is done using fluorescent primers. The newly synthesized fragments are analyzed by an automated DNA sequencer. The sequencing reaction gives about 500 base pairs. So, for each cloned fragment, we know the 500 bases on each end. Each of the hundreds of clones is sequenced in the same manner. The final step in shotgun sequencing is to assemble the sequenced fragment into one full-length sequence. This is done by the use of computer algorithms which compare the completed sequences and find overlapping contiguous fragments. This contig sequence is possible because the original shearing of the target genome produced random overlapping DNA fragments. Because the fragments overlap, the sequenced end of one fragment often supplies some of the missing sequence data from the center of the contiguous region. The result of sequencing this library in this manner is a number of contig sequences covering most of the genome. There will be some gaps in the contig sequences because some sequences are missing in the library. Okay, now that animation is a little bit dated, but it explains the methods that were used for all of the early genome sequencing projects, including the first human genomes and Drosophila, C. elegans, um, Arabidopsis, so all these model organisms we talked about, their genomes were sequenced via that method. Modern methods are faster and cheaper, but still have the same basic overall pattern. So I'm just going to review it. You don't need to memorize like all of the enzymes that are used, but here are the major concepts that you need to know about genome sequencing. Okay. So first, we have to get a sample, of course, and then often there is amplification, so we make extra copies using a modified PCR method. Then the genome is fragmented and sequenced. <coughs> and the key here is that it's sequenced these individual fragments of the genome are sequenced many, many, many times, and they're random fragments, and so that means we have lots of overlap. It also means that we have to sequence far more DNA than it, in, in total than is found in the genome, usually about 50x, so that we have adequate cover coverage when we try to put together all of these um, randomly sequenced. Now, the current kind of state-of-the-art standard is done by a company named Illumina, um, if you want to, you can watch. I don't even know. We may have done that for this class. I usually do that for my other class. But 
I don't care that you know all of the mechanisms, but just know that shotgun sequencing is still the methods to do it, even though our methodologies are a little bit more advanced. We no longer need bacteria to insert the piece of the gene into it. We can do all of that in silico, basically on a in a tube and then on a chip, and then we can actually watch and extrapolate using the uh, equipment and the software what the individual sequences are of all of those random fragments. We assemble them all together. So the benefit is, with adequate coverage, we can get every single gene, in fact, every single s sequence in the entire genome. Now, these drawbacks were really a thing of the past, and now it is incredibly fast and incredibly cheap. And so really, we can cross out this with now modern advances in the last five to 10 years. Uh, we no longer have these costs, uh, these drawbacks of it being costly. The original human genome took hundreds of millions of dollars uh, before it was sequenced and years and years, about a decade for the first human genome from the time the project started until the time uh, the first draft sequence was completed. Uh, now we can do the same thing for a couple thousand dollars, probably within a week. Um, a lot of that money was also development of methodologies, development of equipment and technology that was needed to do it. And so it's advanced and gotten very, very fast and very cheap. So. We can get uh, genomes of entire organisms. There's still a ton of work after we get the genome to identify genes, compare them to previously published genomes in closely related species, and figure out all of what is in the genome. And so that process is called genome mapping and gene annotation. Okay, so that is figuring out what all the features, and especially the genes, but sometimes other features also, figuring out all the features of a genome are. Now, once we have done that for many different organisms, we can begin to understand how the changes of those genomes have taken place. And to do this, we need to know relationships. So here is a little bit of an expanded view of the phylogeny that we have already learned of metazoa. Okay? I don't expect you to know it at this detail, although we've learned much of this already, and you hopefully know some of it already, or at least can refer to it, because you will need to know these as we move forward, and that's why we learn them in Unit 1. Okay, So we've got bilateria, right? And with that node representing the last common ancestor of all bilateria, the deuterostomes, the protosomes, lophotrochozoa, this group is ectisozoa, even though it's not related. Hopefully that's all somewhat familiar to you. And we've been focusing primarily on arthropods and the vertebrates, and we'll continue to do that, but realize there's some really cool things, and we'll look from time to time at some cool studies that have been done in some of these other groups. Now, it's only when we know how these things are related that we can begin to understand how their genomes and the genes inside those genomes have evolved. And to do this, once we have established what the features are in each of these genomes, we can then map those features onto a phylogeny. This class, we don't do gene mapping. That's uh, one of my other classes, the molecular evolution class. We do a little bit more of that and learn how it's done. And if you're interested, you can take that course. Some of you already might have some idea. Don't worry about it. Just know that it can be done. And so once we do that, we can identify where in the history of these organisms certain features of whatever they are, whether it's genomes that we're looking at or physical features once we have a good phylogeny and understand the features in, their, in all of these descendants. We can figure out where they evolved in the different ancestors. <coughs> and one of those features are gene duplication, which we'll be talking about in more detail here in the, in the coming lecture. So we can map gene duplication events onto phylogenies and figure out where in the history of these organisms they occurred. We could also map specific sequence divergence. Where did some sequences begin to evolve? And maybe even determine whether there was selection pressures on some lineages that were not present in other lineages. We can identify the origin of brand new genes or groups of genes, right? So to some extent, that involves gene duplication and those things overlap. So one of the things we're vitally interested in with EvoDevo is when does our genome innovation and evolution in the genome how does that correlate with and map on to the physical differences? And then maybe even asking questions, do changes in the genome lead to major changes in organisms? And of course, the short answer is going to be yes, but does it happen all the time? Every time we get major genome changes, do we see major physical differences? Or 
is there a subset? You know, what are the types of changes in the genome that might lead to important big changes in the organisms? And so because of our large data sets, because of our ability to map those changes onto relationships, we can begin to answer and address those questions. And we're going to be looking at, actually, I'm going to change this. I'll, when you have this version, hopefully it will say three. At three major in intervals of innovation in the toolkit genes, okay? So there are three major intervals, and these are the Hox genes, but three major intervals where we have a change in the Hox genes that also leads to a major morphological change, okay? The first one is at this transition to triploblastic bilaterians, and you can just say bilaterians if you want. Often those words are used together. This means these organisms that have three distinct developmental tissues in early development and are bilaterally symmetrical. So that includes all the deuterostomes and all of the protostomes. And at that, somewhere before those organisms diverge from the rest of the animals, we have a key change in the Hox genes. We'll look at that in a coming lecture, what that is. The other one is at the base of the vertebrate lineage. Okay. Uh, so here we've got a major change at the base of the vertebrate lineage. Now the third one, I'm going to hold off on just a little bit, and when we go into more detail about these two, we'll also introduce the third one. Okay, so just kind of put a little asterisk or a pin in that, and we'll come back to it. Now, what if we don't have DNA samples, right? What about um, animals that uh, are only present in the fossil record? We are greatly limited with those, right? We can't do genomes as much as um, Michael Crichton Jurassic Park would lead you to believe that we can look at entire genomes and reconstruct extinct animals. It's really not possible, maybe with a little ex exception for very recently extinct animals that are very, very well preserved like woolly mammoths. But things like dinosaurs and certainly before their, t their time period, we don't have the genomes or even the samples where we could sequence genomes for those organisms. But what about the reverse? What if we don't have any fossil record at all? Can we tell something about ancestors? Like, so for instance, if I wanted to look at the ancestor of all deuterostomes along this line, but I didn't have good fossil or maybe only very fragmentary fossil records of what they look like, could I determine what they look like? And the answer is yes, because if we understand relationships and we can accurately map characteristics, so we may even be able to understand what the genome, to, to a, a very large extent, what the genome of this extinct ancestor of all deuterostomes look like if we can map genomic characteristics onto these phylogenies and map them to that ancestor, right? So we could now genetically define, talk about, understand to a fairly large extent what the genome and the genetics of this extinct animal that we don't have any samples of, what it was like. So we could do that for all animals. We could do it for deuterostomes. We can do it for any group for which we have a good phylogeny. Now, one key concept that I teach in my molecular evolution class, and it's important here that I want you to understand, is the idea of an outgroup. An outgroup is simply the branch, which may include many, many descendant species, but the branch that is the closest relative of the group you are talking about. So for instance, the outgroup for the deuterostomes would be all of the protostomes, because that is the branch that is the closest relative of all the deuterostomes. And in a reciprocal manner, the outgroup for the protostomes would be all of the deuterostomes because they are their closest relative. And it's really important that we know what the outgroup is because that gives us our closest connection and allows us to compare in a, in a relative sense going back farther and farther and farther what the ancestors were like. And so for our two key groups that we've talked about and that we'll continue to talk about to a large extent, I want you to know the outgroup. So for vertebrates, the outgroup is this interesting lancelet or amphioxus, which uh, we've already mentioned. I showed it to you in a previous lecture. So they are also called the cephalochordates. That's the scientific name. Amphioxus is a little bit more of a common name. right? So the closest living relative of all of the vertebrates are the cephalochordates, and they are all part of the larger chordate lineage. For the arthropods, which includes our insects that we're focusing on a lot, but the arthropods in general, their closest living relative are the onychophora, and this is probably one you're not familiar with. Their common name are the velvet worms. They have segments. They have a leg on each individual segment, but all their legs are pretty homogenous, meaning the, or a better term even, is homonymous. 
meaning the front segments are similar to the back segments. I got a video link there. Let's see what that is. I don't even remember. It looks like it's still there. So here's what a velvet worm looks like in its wild habitat. And they don't look very arthropod-like. There is a true arthropod, very, very distant relative. Notice their legs are not really segmented, right? They're almost like a teddy bear legs, but useful. They have little uh, suction uh, little claws on the end that they can use to, to move around. And they move a little bit like our modern centipedes with waves of motion in the legs. That's the point of music too. So they are predators. I think you've probably seen the predator sequence. Um, I'm going to stop this now. Um, but, um, oh, maybe it's mating. It's called Boy Meets Girl. Anyway. If you're interested, you can click that link and continue to watch it. But you need to know that the Anacophora or the velvet worms are the closest living relatives of all the arthropods. And because of that, they share many features like external segmentation, like an appendage on every segment, like antenna, and many other features. But there are other features that they don't have that we can infer evolved in the ancestor of the arthropods and were not present in the ancestor of these and uh, other ones. Here's a, an image of Amphioxus. They're still somewhat common, but not very diverse. And that's a little bit of a close-up. Again, with many features, including somites and other things that are invertebrates, but lacking features that uh, the, uh, evolved only in the ancestor of all of the vertebrates. So this outgroup concept is key for our understanding of where features evolved and what the ancestor might have looked like.